Greetings and welcome to No BS Baking. You got JP here. Now today I'm going to do a little bit of a follow-up to my previous video, which was on volumetric measurements. And today what we're going to do is we're going to cover off pans. We're going to take a look at the different types of pans. We're going to figure out how we can calculate um, the perfect dough size. We're going to be able to take a look at recipes and evaluate if the pan size works for us. And we're also going to be able to understand um, the type of finished product characteristics that we're going to get. Uh, by using this pan with this amount of dough. So without further ado, let's go. So when it comes to pan types, there are a lot. What is a standard pan in one country may or not be a standard uh, size in another. Thankfully, from country to country, there is some commonality, often varying with an inch or a few centimeters here or there, and are available in a multitude of shapes, sizes, and materials. Now, when looking at recipes online, the chances are really good that you'll come across one that will use one of these three pan sizes or something very similar. These are what one could deem common base pan sizes. Now, the first two pans are generally for smaller to medium sized loaves, whereas the 9x5 is often referred to as a two pound pan and may even have the weight stamped into it. And here you can see some of the variations to the common home baker two pound pan. However, these are also used successfully to bake bread with 32 ounces or 900 grams of finished weight, but we'll talk about this in a little bit. Now, in the U.S., when they're calculating volume or the capacity of pan, you may see it is expressed as cups. What this refers to is the amount of U.S. cups of water rounded up or down to indicate the pan capacity or approximate it. With this system of measurement, it is not uncommon for these numbers to be ballparked and is often underreported. As you can see that when the math is applied to pans calculated in centimeters with the formula length times width times height, the actual volume is determined. So now let's get into some fun stuff. Now we know that length times width times height in centimeters works perfect for determining pan capacity with the metric system. However, you can get real close even if you want to work in inches. Now here is a down and dirty way to calculate pan capacity using cubic inches convert it to liquid ounces and ultimately to pounds. If any of you remember this recipe from my last video, we're going to look at this based on the pan size recommendations in this recipe, which just happened to be a nine by five inch pan. So here you can see I took a few minutes and converted the recipe from volumetric measurements to weights so that number one, I could evaluate in percentage and determine a batch weight. Number two, so I can understand how much dough the author recommends for each of the two 9x5 pans. Now, I prefer metric for accuracy, but we will determine her recommended dough weight to pan capacity in both measurement systems. But let's start by looking at metric. So we know the number of units is two loaves. Scaling weight for each loaf will be 620 grams. Pan capacity, length times width times height, gives us 2,093 grams. So 620 grams is 30% dough weight to pan capacity. Now, if you watched my video on pan calculations, then you can see that this recipe calls for a dough weight on almost the absolute minimum for this pan. Now, keep in mind that many recipes don't give you exact pan dimensions, and more often than not, the pan height or depth is not communicated. Now, that can make a big difference. So now, 30% dough weight is workable, and for many commercial bakeries, this is a target for low-cost st uh, standard sandwich breads that you buy at your grocer, but it might not be what you're looking for. Now, before we move on, I made this little visual. It's pretty self-explanatory, as obviously, the less dough you put into the pan based on its capacity, the lighter the bread will be. The higher you go for products like rye bread, heavy grains, fruit breads, and the like, the heavier the loaf will be and the denser the crumb. Now keep in mind that there is no formal rule regarding what pan you want to use or should use. However, there are guidelines, so let's look quickly at an example. Now this is a basic 2 pound or 900 gram loaf tin. You can see it even has it stamped in the side of it. So if we use our numbers from the metric conversion we looked at earlier to check our recipe author's dough weight to capacity numbers, let's assume this two pound pan has the same capacity of 2093 grams. 
Now, to the best of my knowledge, the 900 gram stamp to it means that the manufacturer recommends 900 grams of dough weight or thereabouts. Now, if we use this number and do our math, we can see that the recommended dough weight for this pan is around 43 to 45% dough weight to capacity. If we actually bump this up to 900 grams being our desired finished weight, then we could see it will take about 50% dough weight to capacity to achieve this. Now these numbers fall nicely into the guidelines we just reviewed as good container size for nice finished product characteristics and general proofing and baking performance. Okay, so now as promised, let's do the US system. Keep in mind there are numerous ways to work this out, and there are many websites showing different ways. However, the most common one is where cubic inches are translated, albeit quite loosely, into cups and expressed in the metric measurement liters. Sounds weird, huh? US measurements converted to metric? Well, there's a reason. Because it is easier, and unfortunately, no matter how you do the math, the US conversion is less accurate than using all metric for the math, but let's look at this. So as we discussed earlier, cups are used to represent how much water the pan can hold. Well, kind of. Measuring cups are not really an accurate representation of volume, but it can be reasonably close, as you can see within about 4% of the metric conversion. Metric was at about 30, this one about 34, not so bad. Now if you dig deeper, calculating Total pan cubic inches into fluid ounces gets you a lot closer, so let's look at this. So we know that one cubic inch equals 0 0.554 fluid ounces. So we take the actual pan size, we have 9 by 5 by 2 and 3 quarter inches, that equals 124 cubic inches. We round it. We multiply that by 0.55 and we get 69. Now, as you can see, the U.S. system requires more steps and more math, and at the end of the day gives a, gives a reasonably close number. To be honest, when it comes to the U.S. system, I would forget about the measuring and the, of the pans and the rest of it and simply fill the pan with water, weigh it, and express it in ounces. So now in summarizing dough weight to pan size analysis, let's recap. You calculate cubic inches of the pan, Multiply that by 0 0.55 to convert it to ounces. You take your planned dough weight per pan, multiply this by 100, and divide it by 69. Now you'll note that if you actually factor in some of the mixing losses, you know, like dough left over in the mixing bowl or left on the dough hook, and you ac accurately weigh your perfectly divided dough pieces for each pan, you will increase your pan capacity accuracy significantly. Now from the metric side, it is easy. Length times width times height of the pan in centimeters equals the pan capacity in grams. Now multiply your scaling weight times 100 and divide by your pan capacity and you're filling your pan with a dough weight of 30% of your overall pan capacity. So now we understand dough weight to pan capacity. Let's say now we want to increase the amount of dough to 45% from the original 30% and adjust our recipe for this change. Anyone who's followed my channel knows I like to use ratio on proportion. It's simple, it's accurate, and easy to keep organized. The first thing we'll calculate is how much dough we need to go from 30% to 45%. Here's where we'll put our known pan capacity number. What we want to find out is what is 45% of the pan capacity. Now we can quickly do the math. 45 times 2093 divided by 100 equals 942. 940 will be our new dough weight per pan. Now we'll figure out our flour for our new batch size of 1880 grams or two loaves scaled at 940. Once again, it's simple. 1880 times 600 divided by 1252 and you got 900. So assuming you have not laid out your original recipe in baker's percent, you can still do all the ingredient changes by using ratio and proportion. Here's how that works. Now you'll note that the accuracy is pretty much bang on, just using ratio and proportion. Now this, this will work with the US system exactly the same, providing you have your recipe converted to a common denominator such as ounces. Now there are numerous ways and methods out there for figuring all this stuff out. 
But when I went to baking school, ratio and proportion was what I learned as a tool for solving math-based baking problems. Now, the beauty is, is as long as you're organized, methodical, and clear with the answer that you want, then you can tackle almost any baking question in a number of different ways without relying on or remembering other people's math and calculations. Now, if you remember, this was the example I used for calculating increasing my dough weight from 30 to 45% of my pan capacity. In this example, I used and calculated pan volume and said, I want to know what 45% of this is. Now, the beautiful part about ratio and proportion is that you may not think the same way as I am. So you may think that, okay, well, I know my dough was, if I divide it in half was say 626. And I know by doing that pan calculation thing that I learned, I was at 30%. So now I want 45%. So this is how you set up your problem. And you can see that the answer works out to the same. Now, if you remember how I calculated all the ingredients for upsizing the recipe, now I just opted for using total flour because it was the first recipe calculation we made and it was right there in front of me. Now you may opt for a different route based on your thinking at that time. You decide to use the original dough weight and the new calculated dough weight as an example. Now you can see that this makes little to no difference in the final math and so you're Ratio and proportion plan for adjusting your ingredients to fit the new upscaled recipe worked. Excellent job. Now lastly, ratio and proportion is a very valuable tool in the kitchen or bakery. If you're logical, methodically thinking, you can arrive at the answers you're looking for from a number of different angles as we've seen. Now just keep in mind that when using ratio and proportion, follow your headings. Mixing up different measurements will lead to confusion and frustration. Keep your apples together and your oranges separate. If you'd like to find out more about ratio and proportion, see this video in my library. And see you next time, no BS baking.